During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troves, we put out to the sea and sailed straight for Smatharace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, to travel to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the heading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of these listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Iberia, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be Thank to God. God. Let's pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning. How do you respond when God or life itself changes your plan? This question is relevant for everyone in the congregation because at some point in your life, God, or life, if you will, will suddenly and unexpectedly change your plans for your day or even for your life. There's an old Peanuts car cartoon strip that I suspect we all can relate to. In the first panel, Charlie Brown says, I learned something in school today. I signed up for folk guitar, for computer programming, for stained glass art, for shoemaking, and for natural foods workshop." In the second panel, he says, instead I got spelling, history, arithmetic, and two study periods. <laughs> In the third panel, Charlie's friends asked him, so what did you learn? And Charlie says, I learned that what you sign up for and what you get are two different things. <laughs> well, welcome to life, Charlie Brown. What you sign up for and what you get are often two different things. So how do you respond to unexpected disappointments, to a sudden change in your plans? How will you respond in large part depends on the trust, your trust in God and your commitment to place your life in God's hands, to let God use you for his work. David Watson, a pastor and university professor from Minneapolis, writes about a time when he was serving as a pastor in Springfield, Missouri. It was a typically busy day for Watson, full of meetings and administrative paperwork, sermon writing, visiting parishioners. And as Pastor Watson was driving from one meeting to the next, he felt the strong urge to stop by the local hospital to pray for someone. He didn't know for whom he was to pray. He just knew that someone in the hospital needed his prayer. So understand God couldn't have picked a less convenient time to lay this burden on his heart. He was in a hurry, and he had a full schedule. Why would God interrupt his, in his day with such a vague calling? However, in spite of his questions and misgivings, Watson felt God's tug. He pulled into the hospital parking lot and went inside. And he asked a woman at the reception desk if any members of the congregation had asked for him to visit. A man sitting near in the lobby heard Watson's voice and approached him. The man was a janitor at the hospital. That morning, he had cleaned the room of a woman with a terminal illness. And the woman had been watching a religious broadcast on TV, a broadcast of the same pastor, David Watson. As she watched his program, she had prayed aloud, God, if you really exist and you really do care about me, I want you to send that pastor to my room today to pray with me. It might seem like an absurd request to us, but that was her prayer. And the janitor's shift was ending soon, but he prayed to God that he would send the TV preacher to the hospital 
he would stick around and make sure to take him to the dying woman's room. Imagine the look of joy on that woman's face when Pastor David Watson walked through the door. In that instant, she said, in her heart, she knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loved her and had answered her prayer. God changed this woman's plans for the afternoon. But what about when God changes your plans for the rest of your life? If you've ever questioned God's will for your life, if you've ever thought that your life just took an unexpected detour, then you can appreciate this story from Acts 16. Paul and Silas and then later Timothy discovered that sometimes God will look like an unexpected detour or a closed door. As Pastor David Guzik writes in his Enduring Word commentary, the Holy Spirit often guides as much by the closing of doors as he does by the opening of doors. And how we respond to those unexpected moments, those closed or open doors, say a lot about our belief in God. And it says a lot about how God can use us to accomplish his will. Anne Graham Lotz, the daughter of Billy Graham, once wrote that when she faces a difficult situation or a closed door, she doesn't ask God why. It doesn't do any good to ask why, she says. Instead, she asks, what are you trying to teach me through this, Lord? Certain things we have to trust to faith. We have to learn them and God's, leave them in God's hands and trust God's goodness. God's ways are higher than our ways, and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. If you're waiting around for God to answer that question, why, then you can end up bitter and find yourself withdrawing from God. But if you change the question to, what are you trying to teach me through this, Lord? You remain open to God's will and to God's working in and through you. So this is the question that Anne Graham Lotz has learned to ask. What are you trying to teach me through this, Lord? Because she knows that God is still working in every circumstance, no matter how strange or painful it may be for the moment. A man named Roger Visker shows us what that kind of trust might look like. Roger's lifelong dream was to be a police officer. And when he graduated from college, he joined the Kalamazoo, Michigan Police Department. Roger says he loved everything about being a police officer. The job was a perfect fit for his personality, for his passions, and for his skill set. He was promoted quickly through the ranks. Fourteen years passed in which Roger thrived on the police force. And then one day while he was studying his Bible, Roger heard God tell him, Roger, I want you to leave police work and go into the ministry. If God spoke to you today and told you to give up the life you love and start over in a new career, how would you respond? Roger struggled to understand and obey God's leading. But a few weeks later, he finally prayed and turned every part of his life over to God. He even asked God to take away his love of police work. And over the next few months, he met with friends, with a counselor and a college registrar, as well as his extended family. And they all provided guidance and support for Roger's new calling. None of this was easy or quick. Roger and his wife and their children moved to a distant city so he could attend seminary. And since graduating with his ministry degree, Roger has served in four different churches in different states. And he testifies that God replaced his love of police work with a deep love for the ministry. He found a great joy in his new work. He later retired after 22 years of service as a pastor, assured of the fact that God had called him and equipped him for this new life. Roger Fisker trusted God's plan and gave him a new purpose and a new way to impact lives that will live on after him. And that brings me to the central question of the scripture lesson today. Do you expect God to do something important with your life? Let me ask that again. 
Do you expect God to do something important with your life? Do you believe God has a purpose for you? There's a little booklet titled Letters on the Healing Ministry by Dr. Albert Day. And in this book, Dr. Day says that most Christians suffer from a poverty of expectation. Think about that phrase for a moment, a poverty of expectation. We don't expect God to do anything important in and through our lives. We think that God uses other people, smarter people, holier people, more talented people to do his work. But not us. God isn't going to work in and through us to change lives. One quote from the book that really challenges me reads like this. Our chronic weakness is not that we expect too much from God, but that we trust him far too little. We trust him far too little. Paul and his companions did not suffer from a poverty of expectation. They trusted that God would act through them wherever they were. So when Paul dreamed of a man from Macedonia begging for help, he and his companions headed straight in that direction. They ended up in the city of Philippi, and they set out to find a group of Jewish men to share Jesus' message with. And then, once again, God changed their plans. Paul and his men instead came across a small group of women gathered by a river praying. Was this really God's big mission opportunity for them? After all, women ranked low in power and standing in the society of that day. However, that's no problem for God, as we've often seen. God works through all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances. David McLemer shares the story of Pastor Chuck Smith, who led a small church in Costa Mesa, California, back in the 1960s. And this church was located very near a local beach. Pastor Smith noticed that a number of young people began attending the church, some of whom hadn't attended church before. One thing stood out. They most certainly didn't know anything about dressing in their Sunday best, back in the days when we dressed in our Sunday best. In fact, many of them came directly from the beach to the church on Sunday morning. Some even walked in without shirts or shoes. Now, that wouldn't have been a problem except that the beach had oil deposits in the sand and oil clung to their feet. A few longtime members of the church got upset when these young people tracked oil on the church's brand new carpet. One Sunday, Pastor Smith got to church and found a sign on the door that said, shirts and shoes, please. And he realized that some young people would feel excluded from the church because of that sign, and they might never come back. Think about that for a moment. What barriers do we place between God and the people around us? What limits do we place on God's work? Paul and his companions were committed to preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to Jewish men. Did God really divert them from their grand missionary journey so that they could preach to a group of women? Well, at least one of the women, a woman named Lydia, was even a Gentile. And was this unexpected and maybe uncomfortable situation really an opportunity from God? Evidently, Paul and Silas and Timothy thought so. They sat down and they began to speak to the women. And the Lord opened the heart of Lydia, and she and her entire household were baptized that day. But that's not the end of the story. But let's get back to Pastor Smith and his church's oily carpets for a moment. Smith called a meeting of the church leaders that day. And those leaders caught a vision of what God would do and could do through them if they threw away their barriers and limitations and welcomed these young people without reservation to their church. They decided that if they had to tear out the pews and rip up the carpet to make those young people feel welcome, they would do it. And Pastor Smith reports that God brought revival on that little church. They attracted more and more young people and their congregation grew in vitality and spiritual maturity, all because they committed 
to removing any barriers that might make people keep people from hearing and receiving the word of God. And that brings me to the final question for this morning. Will you obey God's calling, whether you understand it or not? Remember that you're God's partner in the healing and salvation of the world. You're God's partner in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed us to the message of reconciliation. Now listen carefully. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You see, God can't do much with a life that isn't committed to him. God can't do much with believers who don't see every moment of their life as an opportunity to do the work of Jesus in all circumstances. There's a thought-provoking quote that you may have seen that's circulating on social media. It says, those who put everything in God's hands eventually see God's hand in everything. How true I think that is. Those who put everything in God's hands eventually see God's hand in everything. And that's what Paul and his companions did. They put everything in God's hands and they saw God's hand in everything. So let's finish our scripture lesson for today. Lydia and her entire household were baptized that day and they invited the men to stay at her house. And Lydia started a small Christian church in her home and it was the first Christian church in the Western world. And it was from this small outpost in Philippi that the message of Jesus spread throughout Europe and eventually to the U.S. and eventually to you and to me this day. It's amazing what God can do with just a few committed men and women. Let me close with a story of what can happen when we follow God's leading to an unexpected place and an unexpected opportunity. Many years ago, Pastor John Cochran was called to lead Trinity Lutheran Church Northside in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When God first called him to this congregation, John thought that he had been some kind of mistake. He didn't think that he would fit in. And at the time, the community around his church had much poverty and many needs. But John was resolved that with God's help, he would give his very best to this challenging situation. The church began an after-school program for children to keep them off the streets, and they began ministries to men in prison and men battling addictions. And Pastor Cochran even opened his own home and invited some of these men to live with him temporarily in order to give them a fresh start in life. And in an interview with Pittsburgh Magazine, Pastor Cochran recalls how unsure and unprepared he felt in the early years at that church. He says, in the beginning, there were so many times I just wanted to quit. I would pray, Lord, you've made a mistake. But he stayed where God had led him and waited for some kind of answer. And one day that answer walked through his office door. His name was Ike, and he was 10 years old. And Ike came up and sat on Pastor Cochran's knee. And he asked, how long are you going to be here, Pastor Cochran? Was honest with the boy. He said he really didn't know. And then Ike wrapped his arms around Cochran's neck. And he said, don't go anywhere. If you're here, I'm going to make it. Pastor Cochran said in that moment, he knew that God's answer to his prayer was both yes and no. No, he didn't make a mistake. And yes, he can do it. He can do it. God does his greatest work through ordinary people like you and me. If we really believe that, we will live in constant hope and expectation and joy.
God places his greatest opportunities right in front of us in the ordinary circumstances of our everyday lives. So what about you? What about you? Do you expect God to act through you?